most liberating event for me, when I, when I really, it became clear to me, I was carrying around the weight of the world, so burdened down with these people, visible and invisible, people who I used to see in this church and people who I've never met in my life. How could it be that we as creatures could become so hateful? What is it in our nature that can make us turn so vile against each other? And then you, you start looking at the repertoire of people, and most of those people, by the way, not so much the invisible, but the visible ones, are the ones that you've had close proximity with, and usually they're the ones you've led into your intimate circle of existence. You'll find the ones that hurt you the worst are the ones you've let come into your heart the most. Sound like experience to you, any of you? A little bit? Yeah, that's what I thought. Now, before I get started, this message wouldn't be what it is if I didn't read you some quotes, which I think I've tried to find a few new ones for you, but there's a few old ones that I certainly do like. Um, these are quotes about forgiveness. The weak can never forgive. Forgiveness is an attribute of the strong. Gandhi said that. And I have a very long quote from Mother Teresa. People are often unreasonable and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If, you, if you're honest, people may cheat you. Be honest anyway. If you find happiness, people may be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good you do today may be forgotten tomorrow. Do good anyway. For you see in the end, it's between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway. I like that one. C.S. Lewis, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. I love this one. It's my favorite one by Oscar Wilde. Always forgive your enemies. Nothing annoys them so much. <laughs> it's my favorite one. And Paul Young, who is the author of the book The Shack, Someone gave it to me. I started to read it, and then other things happened. Forgive me. But I do have a quote from him here. It says, forgiveness is not about forgetting. It's about letting go of another person's throat. Forgiveness doesn't create relationship. Now, I'm going to add to what he said two words. Trust does. When you forgive someone, you release them from judgment. But without true change, no real relationship. Now, I want to underscore what he said. Without true change, no relationship can be established. Now, that's a pretty good deal there. And if you're wondering, in the secular realm, there are plenty of folks who have made this their field of expertise. Dr. Luskin, PhD from Stanford University, his specialty is on the subject of forgiveness. It's secular. There's no God theory in it. There's no need for God in it, by the way according to him. I don't want to diss his work because it is still a brilliant work. Um, another doctor, Dr. Everett, um, Dr. Everett Worthington, who also has done tremendous uh, work on the subject. And it seems like if you really are honest with yourself and you comb your heart, you'll recognize that we've all grappled with this thing. How do we forgive someone who's done something so evil to us? How do you bring yourself to that? Have, am I the only person that deals with this, or, or, or are you all, you're all saints? You've never had this problem before. <laughs> Lord, have mercy on me. The toughest thing to do is to come to grips with some of these terms, and then you realize you really need God's help. The secular folks may have their solution, but without God's help, you can't do it. Now, I love what Paul said. Paul, in 2 Corinthians, he was addressing one man who had done something, and he basically says, and I forgive him. If you forgive him, I forgive him. And he adds one sidebar, lest... Satan should get advantage of us because, you see, that's one of the brilliant tools. If we can, 
If our joy can be taken away, if we can be filled with guilt, shame, anger, bitterness, reproach, if we can be filled with those which are essentially the fruit of the fall, uh, that's a great victory for Satan. Just juxtapose the idea that if the fruit of the Spirit that God gives to us is joy, peace, love, etc., etc., just look for the opposite. And there you'll find, you know, people say, well, but can you really live your life like that? Can you be forgiving? Have you ever asked the question, can something be too evil to be forgiven? Or better yet, I've said this once or twice in my life, I don't feel like it. <laughs> You ever said that? I just don't, I just, I don't feel like it and I don't know how I can. Now that's a momentary blurb of insanity for the Christian. See, for the Jew and, and for the folks practicing, I've got many good Jewish friends and many friends from, uh, that are Muslim, I Islam faith, and um, the concept of forgiveness is achieved more or less by good works, by doing good and appeasing, if you will. Let's not even go down the pathway of other religions. So Christianity, to me, if someone were saying, how do I genuinely deal with this? Christ offers the way, but you've got to be willing to listen. Now, many times... And I've said this before many times, we make ourselves the worst prisoners. Our mind, our mind is very interesting. You know, people say when something happens, how do you move on? Forgive and forget. Why are we supposed to forgive and forget? And is that possible? I'm going to answer a few of these with Scripture. And if you've heard this before, don't zone out because there's a little twist to what I'm going to say today. I don't know how it's possible to forget. How do you forget? Does God magically erase your mind? You know, I wonder how many of you have scars on your body, and, and they're pretty good-sized scars. And every time you look down at that scar, even I have childhood scars. Every time I look, I remember what that is from. I've never forgotten. This one here and that one there and those there and these over here and all of them. They're reminders of my past. They will never go away. They're as healed as they're going to be. Now, do I need to re relive the pain of that injury every time I look at the scar? No, but the scar remains. So forget the idea somehow that God's way of dealing with our issues is somehow to make us have amnesia regarding our past. In fact, that doctrine, I've heard somebody say, well, just block it out. That doctrine will create more havoc for you over the course of time than anything else. Your mind, picture your mind as a house, and there are several rooms in the house, and you lock this room, you securely lock this room because to contemplate these hurts over here is too painful. Lock the door, throw away the key. Now pretty much every room in the house here is taken up with shut doors of bad memories and hurts. There's no place for you to live, let alone God. You've made a fact place locked down with no possibility to open up. Now, if we could wrap our minds around that, we don't need to relive the events and constantly relive them, but we must be honest with ourselves. If we wish to move on, there must be honesty, soul-searching inside that says, these are the things, folks, that have got to go. They're killing me. They are poison to my soul. So, let's get into the scriptures. And... While you're turning, you know I'm going to first take you to Matthew 6. And if you're listening at home, follow along with us. It's pretty important. If I tell you this message, second after the resurrection, changed my life, it took what I've called the weight of the world off my back, and it let me start living 
the freedom that Christ promises when he says, whom the Son sets free is free indeed, no longer bound. He said he came to deliver the captives and heal the brokenhearted. And I've been looking for, well, tell me how to, how to get healed. I know what the Old Testament says regarding Christ. The Lord laid upon him the iniquities of us all. Laid on him. I don't have to carry them around anymore. And like the woman that they were going to stone because she was caught in the very act of adultery, where are thine accusers? Because Jesus' words, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. Where are you accusers? Now, in case you're impatient with me because you want me to hurry up and get to the point of things, <laughs> keep in the back of your mind God had, a reasons for, God had a reason for saying, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. He had a reason. He didn't say it because he said, boy, that just sounded good. <laughs> it means one of these days, God's going to settle the score for you. You don't have to. If there's one thing that I take comfort in, by the way, is that this has so transformed my life. This is not a subjective thing. This is not, it worked for me, now you try. This is an absolute prescription for the soul. I have many prescriptions for the soul, but this one, man, oh man, you, if, you, if you have had... No, I don't even have to put if. I'm sure that most of you listening to me have carried guilt about something. Maybe it's a failed relationship. Maybe it's a failure to be a better mother or a better father. Maybe you're trying to figure out, I really messed that up back there. And now, not only do you have the guilt and the shame of what you haven't done, but you've got to listen to those, your accusers, by the way, reminding you of what you didn't do in your failures that constantly come back to torment you. Well, I have a good message for you then. The disciples come to Jesus in another gospel and ask Jesus to teach them how to pray. In Matthew's gospel in chapter 6, he teaches them to pray. This was never the Lord's Prayer. I know the whole world refers to it as the Lord's Prayer, but Jesus couldn't pray this prayer. He taught his disciples to. He did not need forgiveness. He didn't need the contents of this message of instruction on prayer. His prayer, his high priestly prayer, which is the true Lord's prayer, is in John 17, where he is speaking to the Father. Here he's teaching the disciples to pray, and he says, when ye pray, you pray this, you disciples, right? So in chapter, chapter 6, and I'm just highlighting the words within this prayer. But after this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And here it goes. Six times we'll count. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our de debtors. There's two. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Let me jump down. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. And if ye forgive not men their trespasses, Neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Six times Jesus mentions the word forgive. Now I have to confess something to you. This has been a passage of contention for many people because the question then is begged, well, is your salvation contingent on you doing what Jesus says you need to do, ought to do, should do, have to do? And the answer is, if you go down that pathway, you've understood nothing of what Jesus has said. Let me explain something. And it's in part an apology to a lady, uh, a chaplain I worked with a few years ago. I was in her presence. We, have, we have definitely have a theological chasm between us. She definitely comes from a more traditional Catholic background. And in our discussion, she referred to the cross, and she said, the two parts of the cross, you see this part of the cross and this part of the cross, and she said, this part of the cross, you know, you can't take a Catholic out of the Catholic here. <laughs> this part of the cross, 
is aimed towards God and this part of the cross is aimed towards man. When she said it, I thought, no. But as I began to contemplate that, I really understood in the realm of this prayer, and particularly of this prayer, there is the God-man relationship and then there is the man-to-man relationship, which cannot be escaped because Jesus said in John's Gospel, all men will know that you are my disciples by this, that you have love towards one another. And many people don't like that. John elaborates later on and says, we know we've passed from death to life because we love the brethren. And not everybody's lovable, but you love them anyway. You know, Paul, Paul gives, I'm, I'm still in, in Matthew 6, don't think I've gone too far away. Paul gives a definition, I had to write them down to make it brief, of the definition he defines love to the Corinthians, by the way, who had every spiritual gift and every great thing that could go on, but he had to, he had to define love to them. Patience, long-suffering, kind, generous, humble, courteous, unselfish, good temper, guileless, and sincerity, summing up the su supreme gift of love. So, there's something to this relating to one another that Jesus obviously put a premium on, and it cannot be taken as contingent. This is contingent upon that, but rather the two exist at the same time, and they must be understood simultaneously. Now, why did, why did Jesus put such emphasis on forgiving? And I've underscored this many times. He uses the word debt, and he's going to use the word debt repeatedly. Debt, debt, debt. Now, right understanding of where we are creates the absoluteness. You may have to figure out you are a debtor. Some of us maybe came into the world thinking, no, no, no. You're a debtor, and you'll always be a debtor. You didn't create yourself. You didn't put breath in your lungs. You didn't do any of that. You're a debtor. All right, forgive six times, and I think this is quite remarkable as well. I never pointed this out, but I think it's interesting. Six times, which is the number of man, or the number of a man, he uses the word six times forgive, and that Greek word, which I've said many times, and looked up in the dictionary to make sure I give you the specifics. So I wrote, to send off, to set aside, to hurl, to release, to let go, and to let be. The Greek word, aphesis. And it seems like every time I have read through this, I've looked at the big picture while Jesus is talking about the proper manner of alms and prayer and fasting. Right nestled in there, he makes such a force on the word forgiveness that it almost comes to the forefront of everything in that sixth chapter. Now he's going to speak on forgiveness again. Go to Matthew 18 because now he's going to elaborate. And I would just add previously, when I've taught on this, I've always started with Peter coming to Jesus and saying, if my brother sins against me, how often should I forgive him? Seven times? But rather, I'd have you go back just a little bit because in that 18th chapter, beginning at the 15th verse, Jesus says, Moreover, if thy brethren shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him, alone. Do you know how many professing Christians are not willing to do that? Their whole MO is to stir as much skabal as humanly possible <laughs> to base, to abase you, to break you down, to humiliate you. I've only had one person actually come and do something like this where they said, the Bible says, between you and me alone, and that's what must be done. And I received it. Now, I'm not going to tell you whether I was in the right or the wrong. It doesn't matter. The person did according to what the Scripture says and tells us to do. If you shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. If he won't hear you, now you come with two or three. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And no one ever wants to go to that first one. Come to you and tell you to your face. That is, friends, that's probably the other thing that grinds me about the Internet. 
is people have this, it is this childish, it's cowardice. They can't just confront you. They have to make sure that they do it in such a cowardly way. It's not confrontation, it's pollution. One on one, if he won't hear, you bring two or three. And if he won't hear, then you tell it to the church, okay? But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. In other words, no, it's not part of the equation, just leave it be. And here is, here is what I want you to really focus on. He says, verily I say unto you, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, or whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. This becomes the realm of understanding what Peter's going to ask and what Jesus is going to say about forgiving. If you're willing and truly wanting to know what it is that God's trying to say, there are certain things here that you may release here on earth. You may release them. And if you release them not, trust me, they will come with you. Especially if you've been given the instructions and you refuse to do them. This clenched hand can never be the hand extending love. It'll always be a clenched fist waiting. Or it becomes an open hand that becomes vulnerable, that risks itself in love, in sincerity, and in goodness for Christ's sake, not for anybody else's, for Christ's sake. I have a Bible to back that up as well. Here comes Peter. Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him. Seven times? Seven times. In the Jewish realm and in the Jewish frame, he only had to do it three times, you know. That's doing your due diligence. Three times, and then you've done your part. That's it. Seven times? I don't know why the number seven, except maybe in Peter's understanding, that's the number of completion. Is that it, Lord? Is that, is, that, is that all I have to do? And Jesus said to him, and here's, I want you to see this is another uh, little foci here. Jesus says, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. Oh, if you're going to do the math, that's 490 times. Now, have you ever considered, let's start with the husbands and wives, or you parents. Have you ever considered the fact that you may have to forgive your spouse, or your children, or your friends, 490 times, as if to say, if you were to take, I don't know, 16 or 18 waking hours, do you know how many times you would be forgiving people in a day if you were doing that 490 in a day just in the waking hours? Because I don't think you can forgive in your sleep, by the way. You're not that good. <laughs> Neither am I. Have you ever stopped to think that you may have to actually, you know, I'm sorry, in a world of disposability where people get married and divorced just like that, marriage is just like disposable razors, you use it once and throw it away. <laughs> have you ever concluded that possibly, it's just remotely possible that God gave these instructions because he knew and knows our frame. You see, we love to accept the good part of people around us. That's easy, right? Right? Yes, it's easy to accept the goodness and love of people around you. Just take it, right? You don't have to work at taking goodness, do you, Charles? No? no. It's, the, it's all the bad stuff. You know, it's the stuff that after you get married, you go, oh, boy. <laughs> Wow, this is a real good deal here. Wow. <laughs> Wish somebody would have told me about this before I said I do. Because now I'm wondering why I did. <laughs> you know, if you're so eager to take the good part of the person and their good traits, you're going to have to learn this. You may, be, you may be forgiving somebody 490 times in a day. Now, I have an expression about marriage. You bought it, you own it. <laughs> Sorry. All right. That's just gratuitous information. I 
was thinking you might want to know possibly. But this is what I like about what Jesus does. He makes it so clear when he elaborates and gives this parable at this point. He makes it so clear that if you've missed this one, there ain't never going to be a clear picture for you. I'm sorry. You know, people say, well, this is an old dispensation. I'm sorry. This is the Lord speaking to us, giving us this picture. And he says, therefore, is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he'd begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents. That's a large amount of money. Obviously, I'm reading from the King James here. A large amount of money. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife, and his children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. Now, this is us, friends. This is us. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me. I'll pay it all back. You know, when you walk into God's light after what Ephesians calls being the children of disobedience and the bright light of God comes on you and you realize what a wretched sinner you are and how you've wasted your life or your gifts or your time, your talent, your money or whatever it is that you've wasted, at some point you have this recognition, debtor, I can't pay anything back. Oh my God, Lord, help me. Be merciful to me. Here's this man being told he's going to lose everything, and he still has to pay the debt back. And the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, loosed him, that's the other Greek word, which is to completely let go and release. The first one I gave you out of Matthew 6 is to set aside. This one is to completely let go and release and forgave him. That's the same first word, the debt. There's your word again, right out of the Lord's uh, disciples' prayer, the debt. Now, this is us. We get forgiven everything. Clean slate. I'm a child of God now. Clean slate. And here I go out of the king's presence, and I find a guy who's a debtor to me, and the debt is small. And I want you to think about hurts and things that people have done to you. This man goes out, found one of his fellow servants which owed him a hundred pence, so well, let's put this in perspective. The first guy's debt is so huge, it's, I referred to it the last time, as the national debt, just by analogy to be ludicrous, and he finds a guy who owes him ten, ten bucks, okay? That's, I mean, it's really, that's not as big a chasm, but I'm trying to paint the picture as extreme. Finds one that owed him a hundred pence, he laid hands on him, took him by the throat, and said, pay me! took him by the throat, pay me, pay me what you owe me. Now this is the man, the same man that had just been forgiven everything. Finds one that has such a, just a little nothing. His fellow servant fell down on his feet, besought him, saying, have patience with me. He said the same thing. Have patience with me, I'll pay it all back. Well, I got to say that to God. God said, okay, but not for you. Right? He would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. There's a word again. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry, came and told their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after he had called him, said to him, this is the Lord speaking to him, Wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. You asked this of me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant? even as I have had pity on thee. And his Lord was wroth. And I, I love the fact that if you're reading in the King James, it, it does add a dimension, but picture that the Lord who forgave had, he was full of wrath and anger towards the man. I want you to kind of put more current verbiage on this. And delivered him to the tormentors that he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. Now, this is a hard lesson, because you can read it, because you're familiar with it. It becomes a hard lesson because we tend to forget 
the amount of forgiveness that has been given to us. See, you can't read this without going back and verifying what Jesus said in the disciples' prayer in Matthew 6. They go together. They explain. It explains what he meant. The same thing, the same grace that is given to us is extended on a human level. And how do we do this? How do we get rid of these things? How do we heal hurts that we want to get rid of? And if you're going to go down the secular pathway, there are secular things, I'm sure, that work, but I'm not interested in the secular solutions. In fact, one of the most brilliant authors who just he kind of teeters on secular and dabbles a little bit here and there, he's actually um, been promoted, but uh, Louis Smeads, who actually was a local, uh, a local person here in California who really penned some brilliant work on forgiveness. And his thing was three, three phases. Um, we hurt, we hate, we heal. And he proceeded to break down these concepts so succinctly after years of research and study. I, I took at least a few of his points. Um, our, our ability, by the way, to, uh, to hate comes naturally. It's a natural thing. It's not a spiritual thing. That's a natural thing. Our ability to hate. We're either passive or aggressive in our hatred. We're either wanting to carry out, oh, you don't know what I'm, I'm thinking about it. That's aggressive. I'm thinking about it. Passive, eh, it's not worth it. But you know, that person really stinks, right? Passive and aggressive. Um, and then he breaks down the hurt, and he says personal, unfair, and deep pains. Personal in that you'll always find people may say, I'm angry at the government. <laughs> well, unless you're going to personify the government and put some faces. You know, I could think of a few faces to put there. <laughs> yeah, we could definitely find the faces. But the institution itself is not going to work. It's personal. It's always personal. Unfair, it's always unfair. I don't care. You know, even if, even if you, you might say, well, maybe I had it coming, but it's always unfair because in the big picture, we want to be treated differently. We would expect something different from our fellow human beings. And deep pains, annoyances, disappointments. I mean, I'm covering the whole broad spectrum here to make a point to you. There is no condition no situation, no temptation, nothing in this realm that God has not covered in his word. And the deliverance that is possible. Remember the key words here for releasing, to set aside, completely let go. These words from the Greek are hugely important for our understanding. You see, every time I've done this, and I'll do it again, every time, it seems to be the, the analogy that you all like so well. You refuse to take all of your garbage. That's your hurt, your pain, your disappointment, everything that is coming at you from the visible, the invisible, and basically like taking the garbage out to the curb and leaving it there, putting those things aside and leaving them there, those two Greek words leaving the garbage at the curb. Most of us find it irresistible. We want to go dig in the garbage again, and we go to find something, and oh, look at that. That's too good. I can't let that one go. Oh, no. And by the time you're done picking your own garbage, you've brought most of it back in the house. Empty bag is at the curb. Here comes the garbage truck, but all they're going to get is that plastic bag because you've figured out that those goodies are real valuable to you. You can't let them go. Now, I make that illustration because I found in my own life that's what I was doing. Instead of really recognizing that if indeed the Lord laid upon him the iniquity of us all, that's my sins, that's also your sins, then I need to be releasing. Just as Jesus taught, I need to be releasing this. And I'm not releasing these issues for your sake. Yeah. Say you offended me. Say you did something to hurt me. I'm not doing it for your sake. I'm not releasing it for your sake. I'm doing it for mine. Christ instructed me about something regarding me. Now, if the benefits transcend to restored fellowship with you, great. 
But that's the other besetting sin is we, we think, gosh, I was sitting with somebody the other day who said dreadfully to me, you have to forgive me. Can we, can, we press, can we press the rewind button for a minute? My response was, I have been on an ongoing basis. In fact, maybe too much so, but that does not make me a doormat. Understand the difference between forgiving and when a relationship has been breached to the point where it cannot be restored. You forgive. There is no relationship, no friendship, no relationship at all if you don't have trust, beginning with God. If you can't trust God, you don't have a relationship with God. You have religion, maybe, but you don't have a relationship. Husbands and wives, mothers and fathers and children, same thing. If there's no trust, there is no relationship there. Well, what if I have been practicing this art of forgiveness, and I'm calling it that for a minute. I just said to you, it doesn't mean that I'm going to forget the wrongs that were done against me. Like the scars on my body that I have, they are a reminder of injuries. Believe me, you know, when I was a child, I had a bad bike injury, and that's, that's from that, and I can recount them all to you. Never forgot, but I don't have to relive the pain either. Same thing, letting it go, completely letting it go, as Christ has instructed us. Do you think somehow you're going to have amnesia and you're going to forget? No, that's our human nature. In fact, the only person who can forget our shortfallings is God. He says so in his word. He can forget them. He can put them behind our back. He can put them in the abyss of the sea. He can place them on his son, Jesus. They can be carried off with Azazel, that other scapegoat. But only he can do that. Our human frame makes us remember. Now, I've said time is good medicine. But our human frame. Now, I'm going to tell you in a minute what forgiveness is not. But in our human frame, one more scripture, and that's out of Ephesians 4. I could have done this out of Colossians, but I chose to do it out of Ephesians. Now, I'd have you know it in this chapter why this is so important. Because unlike the words of Christ, which I've just quoted to you, which I could have quoted out of Luke's gospel, I could have taken you to Mark's gospel, but they basically reiterate, they say the same thing. Here we have the Apostle Paul. And in this fourth chapter, he's busy telling us about putting on the new man, putting off the old man and putting on the new, which is part of this chapter and the understanding. So it makes perfect sense that the culmination, there was no chapter and verse when Paul wrote, he wrote a letter. Chapter and verse is added later. Verse 31 and verse 32, all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and... There's a conjunction there. And be ye kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. For whose sake? For Christ's sake. So next time you say, I don't feel like it, recognize forgiveness is not a feeling. And forgiveness doesn't happen just because you have, you've read these scriptures and suddenly you think, well, that's it, I'm going to have a, a clean mind now, and I'm not going to think of these things, and I'm not going to think of the people who have provoked me and wronged me. You know, I was talking to somebody else who said, you, you, you could not know the pain that I have and the torment that I have over an event in my life and how I've been criticized for my lack of handling, my immaturity of handling that event. And people will always find the telescopic lens to zoom in so carefully on your shortfallings and remind you of them. And here is where that 490 comes back. You see, when you rightly understand much of these concepts, you begin to understand this. People who are the tormentors, if you will, the accusers, the ones who create the victimized person, if you begin to understand what they really are, that's part of your beginning of healing. They are weak. 
They are frail. They are usually not and have no part of God in them. They may call themselves Christians, but Christ in you, flowing out of you, is love, compassion. You know, what do you think it means to be a Christian? But if Christ is formed in your heart by faith and Christ's spirit, his Holy Spirit lives in you, then it's a dimension of his person living and flowing and having his being through you, which means some degree of his nature coming through you, and it does not look like sister and brother so-and-so over there busy pointing the finger and tearing you down. It looks like Jesus. So, when I read these things, I understand my accusers, my tormentors, the people who have injured me, the people who have brought hurt in my life, they're weak, they're feeble, they're frail. Their only way of, their only display of power, the only display of power they will ever have is human limited power, the power of hatred that will never bring you to the cross, the power of aggression that will never bring you compassion, the power to destroy what they think is destruction. But I've said to you, this was the greatest blessing in my life because had it not been for my enemies, had it not been for the hurt brought on me, I would not have known what Jesus was saying when he said, love and bless those who hurt you, who despitefully use you. Bless those and curse not. How do you overcome evil? You overcome evil with what? Good. We all know that, but trust me, when it's time to, when it's action time, <laughs> hmm, which, which one do I want to go with? I, so forgiving, friends, is not forgetting. You may over time, you may have to ask yourself, well, I'm not really quite sure, why was I mad at that person again? I don't really remember. Which brings me to the subject of knowing when you've forgiven. Well, I should add what forgiveness is not still. Forgiveness is not excusing. You know, some people say, oh, listen, he, he's just like that. You've got to know the way he is. Just, you know what? Just, just wink. She has no clue. She, do, she doesn't know that she just insulted you and hurt your feelings when she said that was the worst dish, the worst pasta, the worst whatever she's ever eaten. She has no clue. Because these are all things that happen. It's not excusing. Forgiveness is not excusing. Nor is it accepting the way somebody is. It's not tolerance. Have you ever been around people you just have to tolerate? Is it a coworker? Is it a family? Well, you just have to tolerate them. And it takes everything in your being to just get by. God's way is not like that. And the healing process that occurs when we come to fully understanding, if I believe I have been fully forgiven and fully pardoned, and now I'm taking the authority of Matthew 6 and Matthew 18 and what the Apostle Paul says, not just in Ephesians but also in Colossians, if I take what is said in John's Gospel about loving one another and in 1 John, the knowledge that we've passed from death to life because we love the brother. If I take all of those things and put them together, I begin to understand that God has given me a way to release these things. And they're not nebulously like one evangelist says, you just got to let it go. Where? <laughs> let it go. Just let it go. Where? Tell me where to put it, friend. <laughs> That's what I said. Pardon me. <laughs> if you are walking in the Christian realm, there is no such thing as a simple, just let it go. That was the hippie thing in the 70s. Let go and let God, and it's all good. <laughs> you want to get rid of it? You take it to the cross. You want to get rid of it? Go back and read Isaiah 53, because when it says the Lord laid upon him, it's speaking of, yes, all the things that I've done, but it's also letting me understand if I have been fully forgiven, and I don't qualify like as if I'm questioning. I know I have, and you have too. And we understand that. 
then Jesus gives us the understanding of what the release mechanism is to get rid of this poison. That otherwise, by the way, in Hebrews says that we should get rid of that root of bitterness because it will contaminate the whole. How do you do it? You take your problems, you take your accusers, you take your hurts of the past, the hurts you didn't deserve, and maybe the ones you had coming, and sometimes you bark. She really had it coming. She deserved it. Maybe so. Maybe he deserved it. Maybe he really deserved what he got, or she did, or maybe I do. I'm telling you something, though. If you're willing to take it to the cross today. Now, this sounds real simplistic because people say, well, I've tried. I've, I've tried exactly what you've said. It's like taking that garbage to the curb and leaving it there. And forgive me, I mean no disrespect in calling it the garbage and then referring to the cross. What I'm saying to you is you must get rid of it and let it go. And that letting go process means the curb, by the way, the curb is where you define this is it. No more baggage for me. I'm taking this one to the cross. Now, the difficulty is that people will read this, they'll hear this, they'll hear the message, and they'll say, well, I've tried to let go, and I'm still angry. Well, there is a natu natural progression to this thing that we call forgiveness. So let me tell you, because this is something I could only conclude today. I couldn't tell you this even the last time I did this. You don't stop being angry overnight. Some of you, it may be something that goes way back to your childhood. You don't stop being angry overnight. Some people think when you come into the church, you're going to get healed right away, and that may be true for some, but it's not true for all. And sometimes you just need to keep going back to these scriptures and doing the same thing over and over again. Lord, this is your word. You said it will not return void. These are promises to me of how to get rid of the poison. I'm bringing it to you, Lord. The scripture says, casting all of your cares, your anxieties upon him because he cares for you. I've brought it to you, Lord. I'm rolling my burden like Psalm 37. I'm rolling it off and I'm putting it on you. Now you take it and you carry it away. And these people, Lord, that have hurt me so badly, these events in my life that have, that have damaged me as a, a human being, Lord, begin to heal the process of, of, of letting go and as that begins to happen, as the healing begins to occur, because the scripture says, he heals the brokenhearted. As that begins to occur, suddenly one day you'll do what I did. It was many years ago when I first came to the conclusion this was my needed message. I woke up one morning and realized I'd stopped talking about these people who had so hurt me. In fact, some of them that I know face to face I began praying for them. I really earnestly began praying, Lord, have mercy on them, help them, forgive them. The most liberating event of my life. Now, there are those people that you cannot see. You can't put a face to it. You don't know who they are. They just, they just, they cause malice in your life. Lord, you do. You're omnipotent and omnipresent. You know where these are. And you said, vengeance is yours, so I'm going to leave it in your hands. In the meantime, I'm going to pray. Oh, I know somewhere in Paul's writings, he says, you know, to, to bless those people, you're essentially heaping up coals, a fire on their head as you bless them and pray for them. But perhaps the most important thing here as we approach the end of the year, more importantly, the end of the message, do you realize you can walk around your lifetime as a Christian carrying these things around and not understanding that the very weight that you've carried for these many years, the burdens, the hurts, the things you have not let go of, they have essentially imprisoned you and robbed you of the full joy that Jesus tells us is ours. Why do you think when he appeared to the disciples after he was resurrected and they were in the upper room, he appeared and he said, peace unto you. That was his first message. He should have just said to the disciples, yo, I'm back, right? <laughs> I'm here, look at me, right? He said, peace unto you. Cessation is over. Enmity is gone. The battle I have conquered for you. We talk about things that Jesus has done, if he's the first goer, 
if he's already gone down the pathway and he's given us the roadmap, this shouldn't be such a scary thing after all. In fact, you'll find that the minute you begin to reflect on the concept of debt, you'll recognize that all of the things, I recognize it now in my own being, that all the things that have been done to me over the course of these seven or eight years, they're rather insignificant. They appeared gargantuan at the time, but they're rather insignificant, and they're insignificant in the realm of understanding the sins of my life, the ones I've been forgiven, the ones that I am committing, and the ones I've yet to commit, that debt is infinitely bigger than any of these other things that may occur. Can I think of the people who have done such ill and such wrong and such malice towards me? Can I think of them and be angry? Well, those old ones, those are gone. I think of those people and see, I smile. It makes me happy because they were the ones thanks be to God, that brought me to this knowledge, this understanding. If it wasn't for my enemies, I wouldn't be able to stand here and tell you about this. If I didn't have any enemies, well, how would I know, right? Okay, that's a logical deduction. But let me just say this. Then life evolves. Those things are in my past. They're gone. I don't think about them anymore. But now, new things crop up. New issues. New enemies. New people to forgive. Maybe some old people that need to be forgiven 490 times. <laughs> and you'll find something remarkable, especially if it's a Christian person. They'll always remind you of what you haven't done for them. That's if two walk together, if they can agree together on these principles. They'll always remind you of what you haven't done. Let me say, because I've never added this, there's one other ingredient, that if restoration and reconciliation in a relationship is possible, based on what I've just told you. Because you should never expect that when you forgive a person that they're going to come back and say, oh, I forgive you too. You're doing it for your relationship with God. They may never come back and say, I'm sorry I wronged you. I'm sorry of what I've done. They may never come to that. They may be absolutely clueless or too evil to even come to that conclusion. Don't wait for them to come and say, oh, gee, I'm so sorry. You forgive them. That's what Jesus said. If they come back to you and they repent and they genuinely are sorry, that's a whole different ball of wax. Reconciliation might be possible. But then you'll be like many who are so injured in their trust department. Learning how to trust is like learning how to walk again. Now God can heal those breaches too over time. With God, all things are possible. Now, you might say to me, I don't need this message today. I think you do. I think after I'm done here, and maybe while I was speaking, some of you did a little soul searching to figure out, yeah, I've got, I've got a couple of things I need to work out here. They are not to turn you into some soapy Christian that's, you know, busy foaming all over people and, you know, you're so, you're so indulgent about and so desperate to want to relate to people that they're just going, oh, no, here comes the syrup person again. No. It's your relationship with God that is at the center of all of this. And I urge you to pray about what I've addressed today for another reason. We never know, because we don't. I, I, I should hope we live our life every day thinking this day is a gift from God. We don't know that if we say, well, I'll work on forgiving that person next year. You don't know when God says it's your time. And when you leave here, you may have some unfinished business in your hand as you go. You know, people say, I want to get my house cleaned up, and I want to get my house in order, you know? Well, it starts with the inside of the house, and you're not doing the house cleaning. That's the Holy Spirit's work. But these are the things that Christ addressed, and I, I really believe if he repeated them so often, we should pay attention. Something repeated more than once, and I only referenced two scriptures, but I can tell you, as I said, Luke and... Mark mentioned the same thing, and the emphasis in John's gospel is according to the principle that covers everything that Jesus spoke of, John, the disciple of love, speaking about these concepts in a different dimension, but they apply. So, you might ask me today, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to make this all come to terms? I was going to read C.S. Lewis. There's some... Um, Quotable Lewis, it's called, but I think I'm just going to tell you what I've deduced from Mr. C.S. Lewis. Brilliant writer, 
incredible contribution to Christianity and to the world in his work. But here's a man with all of his genius. He too wrestled with forgiveness. And there's one story in particular he tells where he says he woke up one day and he realized that after 30 years of being angry at someone for what they had done, he woke up one morning and realized he wasn't angry anymore. This is when you know forgiveness has taken place. The anger towards that person is gone. The thoughts that you think towards that person now are you think of blessing them because you understand their weakness and their frailty and their frame. Most importantly, out of all this comes something very empowering. You know, the scripture says, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. When I am at my weakest, when I feel I have been kicked down the most, when life has just blown me over and I, I just, I think too much evil is around me, too much guilt, too much shame, I can't get up another time. When I am weak, then in that weakness, I become strong. He enables me. I'm able to get up and say, he's given me the pathway. What he has required, he has made possible. He's never made a demand on you or on me of anything that we are not capable of. And no, this is not a doctrine of works. This is a doctrine of liberation for the Christian that instead of waiting for January 1st for you to make your New Year's resolutions and promises you will surely not keep, <laughs> contemplate on this today because in the process of releasing, letting go completely, giving it to God and understanding that that last picture we looked at, which is the word for grace in Ephesians 4.32, it is a sphere of grace that lets you get up again and see and look at the circumstances of your life and say, I'm above this now because Christ has lifted me above it all. I can see the enemies. I can see their tactics, but Satan will not have advantage over me. Greater is he that is in me, that lives in me, that breathes in me, that has his being in me, than he that is the king and prince of the air. Now, if you'll walk in those promises and release what you've been carrying around, go into the new year when people say, I'm making a resolution to lose a little bit of weight, why don't you lose the spiritual weight you've been carrying around? That's my message. <laughs> You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.